So after talking about the concepts of general lands and, and wide area networks, there are many different technologies to choose from for lands and WANs, and, and, and the, uh, the related technologies like personal area networks, metropolitan area networks. Many to choose from in terms of lands today, there are two technologies which are uh, most widely used. One is what we think of a wired LAN, and the common name is Ethernet. So we'll talk about that. And the other technology we mainly use inside local area is a wireless LAN, or the, the marketing name or common name being Wi-Fi. And there's some similarities between Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So a lot of Wi-Fi, your wireless LAN access, uses some similar concepts, addresses, frame formats to Ethernet. In this topic, we'll give a, a brief introduction to Ethernet, so for wired LANs. Uh, for wireless LANs, then we will not cover that, but uh, there's some similarities that maybe if you take some the lab next semester with me, we'll do some more hands-on with Ethernet and wireless LANs. So first we'll talk about general and uh, talk about one of the the groups or standards organization that creates standards regarding LANs. So before we get into Ethernet, you probably have seen or heard of the acronym IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. So it's a, a really a professional organization where people become members of. They do many things. One of the things that we see them uh, a lot is they create standards for electrical and electronic engineering. So they write the standards such that the manufacturers, different manufacturers implement products following those standards so that they can interoperate. Some of them that you may or may not have um, seen, IEEE has created standards for firewire, for cryptography, um, doing arithmetic in computers and many other things, software development, project management and so on. IEEE creates standards across many different uh, fields related to computing and telecommunications. And they give their standards or their series of standards a number. So a very widely used range of standards is those regarding local area networks and originally metropolitan area networks. So they have a committee and the number associated with that is 802. So IEEE 802. And that's what we care about in data communications. So they develop standards for personal, local, metropolitan area, and even more recently wide area networks. So they have many different standards and they are divided into working groups. Most of their standards focus on, if we think of our five layer stack, and you'll need to know for the exam those five layers from bottom up, the physical layer, data link layer. That's what the 802 standards focus on, the physical and data link layer. How to transmit signals, which is the physical layer, and how to get the data efficiently across a link, the data link layer. In fact, the data link layer, they subdivide into two, two layers, one called medium access control, that topic we just skipped, which is about making sure the frames uh, can be transmitted fairly and efficiently across a medium. And logical link contr control, LLC, is about giving addresses and a few other things for, for a link or across a LAN or inside a, a small network. So this IEEE standards organization creates these series of standards under the umbrella of 802. And there are many, uh, they, they keep developing. So some of the older ones are more common, are IEEE 802.3, which is what we'll talk about, Ethernet. IEEE 802.5 was another LAN technology, but not very common anymore, so it, it's old, token ring. IEEE 802.11, which you use on a regular basis, Wi-Fi. So this IEEE 802.11 is the formal name of the standard. You can go and download the document. Wi-Fi is like the marketing name. It's much easier for most people to remember and think about. Bluetooth, so they've had input in Bluetooth, WiMAX, and others. 
Okay, so they create standards on wireless and wired technologies, ranging from personal area networks up until wide area networks. We're going to focus on Ethernet. With respect to layers, so here's our five layer internet stack, physical up to application layer. The efforts of the IEEE standards are mainly on the bottom two layers. So they create a physical layer for, say, for Ethernet, for wired LANs, 802.3, and what we call a medium access control protocol for Ethernet. And similar for Wi-Fi, there's an 802.11 physical layer for how to transmit signals wirelessly, and a medium access control protocol for how to share amongst all the users who want to access that access point and other things, and for Bluetooth, for WiMAX, and other standards. And they have a common 802.2 logical link control, which we'll not talk much about, except we'll talk about the address format that these uh, technologies use. So over, over the years that this group has been creating more standards of improving the current wired and wireless technologies. Let's just talk about Ethernet and the basics of how it works. It's developed, Ethernet was the, the name given to the technology developed in the 1970s for LAN communications. So uh, people wanted to connect, connect the different computers inside a, a, an office environment or inside a company together, like printers, uh, computers, uh, at that stage mainframes and so on. So, uh, at Xerox, the people who made the, the photocopiers, they developed this technology called Ethernet and it became a standard in 1983, which means that other companies started to use it. So when you buy a card, like a LAN card, this one's not quite as old as 1983, but I think it's 1990 something, a LAN card, uh, doesn't matter which manufacturer you buy from, as long as they implement IEEE 802.3, you'll be able to communicate between different LAN cards because they follow the same standard. At the time, there were some competing technologies, but basically Ethernet was the most popular for different reasons and still is the most popular LAN standard. It has evolved over time, so in 1973, or about then, it had a data rate of around three, or of three megabits per second, and they used coaxial cables, like in some audio systems or, or cable TV to your TV. And a bus topology, it used half duplex communications. Many, if there were two computers connected, one could transmit, but the other has to wait for that one to finish. Only one transmits at a time. And the technology was improved over time. So in 1983, around 10 megabits per second. Ethernet 2 was the name. Fast Ethernet, 100 megabits per second, and it supported a star topology. It used a hub. We may say a bit more about that in a moment. In 1990, a switched Ethernet, 100 megabits per second, full duplex links. You could be transmitting and receiving data at the same time from your computer in a star topology with a switch. And that's the, the, the main way that it's, that it's used today. At that point, it used twisted pair. So the, the LAN cables that you use today are, are still twisted pair cables where inside there are four pairs of wires, copper wires, and we've seen them before, four pairs of copper wires inside here, and basically you would transmit a signal across one pair and receive on another pair. So with fast Ethernet and switched Ethernet, of the four pairs inside here, you would only use two in fact. So the other two were, were unused in most cases. So that's how full duplex is achieved by transmitting across one pair of wires and at the same time, you can receive across another pair. And we'll show you the topology in a moment. We'll look at the, the, the typical setup. 
Gigabit Ethernet supported up to one gigabit per second. Still used twisted pair in some cases, but used all four pairs. So transmit across two pairs, receive across two pairs. But it also supported optical fiber. So not so much used inside your home, optical fiber, because it's expensive and hard to deal with, but inside maybe um, connecting servers together, inside uh, data centers then they start to use optical fiber. And in fact, Ethernet has been, it keeps to be developed and is used uh, also in metropolitan area networks, across a city and between cities, wide area networks. And there's 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, and these mainly use optical fiber. 40 gigabit per second Ethernet, 100 and 400 are being worked on or planned. So these are mainly for, say, in the Google data center where they have many servers they need to connect together uh, at a very high speed. They may use variations of Ethernet there or between uh, buildings across the city. So not so much for LANs, these technologies. LANs nowadays mainly use switched Ethernet, in some cases gigabit Ethernet. And that's what we'll focus on, those two. So switched Ethernet. Most LANs today use a star topology. A star topology, we have some special device. A switch. Okay, we have some special device. Here's a small one, a small home or office switch. This has, it needs power. It has eight ports on the back. And you plug your LAN cable into one of those ports. And plug the other end into your PC, what we call our station, a PC or laptop. And then your second PC or com laptop, you plug via another LAN cable into this switch. So all the stations connect via point-to-point -point links to the switch. So for example, this switch can support eight stations connecting. If you want more, then you need a bigger switch. And typically, switches range from two, four, eight ports, 24, 32, 48 is usually the maximum number of ports. So you get a rack, uh, a, a unit that fits in a rack and has 48 ports. If you want more stations to connect, you need to connect those switches together, multiple switches. So you communicate between your computers by sending to the switch, and the switch sends to the destination computer. The key characteristics is that our links are full duplex. I can be transmitting data to the switch to, and onto someone else, and at the same time be receiving data from the switch from someone else. Point to point links, so there's no sharing of the medium. Twisted pair cabling is primarily used in, in home and office lands, not optical fiber. So these are twisted pair copper wires. There are different quality of the wiring, really. So called different categories. Sometimes it says on the, on the outside of the cable, this one says category 5E. So uh, there's a category 6, which is better quality and less interference, allowing for uh, one gigabit per second uh, without any problems. The data rate supported in most lands, who has a laptop? Yes. What's the data rate supported for your LAN cable? Any idea? Can you find it in your operating system? What is it? What data rate does it support? Not sure. Do you want to guess? Anyone else want to help him? How fast could it send if I plug the LAN cable into your laptop and then into the switch and onto another computer? When you bought the laptop, did you look at the specs? Anyone want to guess how fast is a, a laptop today? If you go shopping, how fast will it be able to send over a LAN? 100 megabit per second if you bought it maybe five or 10 years ago. If you buy it today, they'll usually support one gigabit per second. Okay, so most 
uh, PCs and laptops nowadays. So laptops have a, a LAN port and it's the, the LAN card is really on the motherboard. PCs you usually get a either on the motherboard or a separate independent PCI card. Most of them today support a maximum of one gigabit per second. But they all support the low, also support the lower rates. So your laptop will be able to send at one gigabit per second, 100 megabits per second, and probably also 10 megabits per second. The speed that it uses usually depends upon the switch. So this switch, for example, can support up to one gigabit per second. You plug your laptop into this one and you'd be able to transmit at one gigabit per second between laptop and switch. But if you have an older switch, or a cheaper one, like you find at the back of that wireless access point it also has a switch in it, then it will usually only support 100 megabits per second. If your laptop supports 1 gigabit per second and the switch only 100 megabits per second, then they basically auto-negotiate. They choose the highest which both support. Switch 100, laptop 1000, then the laptop will go down to 100 so it can communicate with a switch. So usually they support up to 1 gigabit per second, but some older switches only support up to 100 megabits per second. The standards for the different data rates have different names. Uh, if you look them up, some are called 100 base TX, 1000 base T, 100 meaning the data rate, 1000 the data rate in megabits per second. Different variations of the, the cablings used as well. The typical distance that you can have a link, so from PC to switch, a maximum of about 100 meters. You cannot have a cable longer than that. Random access, we haven't talked about medium access control, but random access is not used. We have point-to-point -point links, meaning the medium is not shared. When my laptop transmits, it's transmitting to the switch, and no one else is using that link. It's dedicated from my laptop to the switch, so there's no sharing involved, which is very good for performance. Any questions on Ethernet? This is one of the easier topics. I think you, you all use it, whether you're aware of it or when you're in the labs, in the lab computers, they're all connected via LAN cables. Any questions on Ethernet? Switch to Ethernet. The star topology. Here's a simple example with six stations. Let's say we have six PCs in our small LAN that we want to connect together. We want to allow anyone to communicate with anyone else. We have this, switching devi this switch device in the middle. So we connect via cables from PC to switch in all cases. Note that Ethernet is for communicating inside a LAN. It doesn't deal with how to talk to others on the internet. It's just the internal communications inside a LAN. So if there's someone else out on another network, Ethernet doesn't deal with how to communicate with them. We'll see that in the next topic on the internet. In general we call these stations. That is A through to F for stations. And they're either in, in the internet we'll see later hosts or routers. A host is like your PC or laptop. A router is a station that will connect to another network. We don't have that in this example, but in the next topic we'll see, okay, we want to connect our LAN to someone else's LAN. So one of these will become a router in that case. But with respect to Ethernet, they're all just stations. Full duplex twisted pair connected to the switch. The switch has multiple ports, so 4 up to 48 for example. Uh, if you want, uh, the, the more computers you want to connect via a switch, the, the larger the switch, the more expensive the switch. 
And what we do is we transmit frames. Because we have point-to-point -point link, we just transmit the frames to the switch, and the switch will do some magic and send it on to the destination. So if A wants to transmit to D, A transmits across its, its link to the switch, switch looks at the frame and sends it on to D. So we need to talk about a little bit about what are the frames, what do they look like, and the magic that the switch does to send it on to D. So let's look at the structure of the frames that we send using Ethernet and importantly the addresses that we use. First the addresses. All of the 802 standards, or almost all of them, whether it's Wi-Fi, Ethernet, and some of the older technologies use the same format of address. So each station gets an address. So when A wants to send to D, they don't have letters like A and D, they have a 48-bit address. So a 48-bit number identifies the station. So the format's defined and it's common across many technologies. So it's important to be aware of it. An IEEE 48-bit address sometimes called a MAC address or a hardware address. You'll come across the different terminology. It's 48 bits in length, but it's split into two parts. There's the first 24 bits, which identify usually the manufacturer or some company associated with the manufacturer of the device. So the manufacturer of your LAN card. So whoever manufactured it, has a unique ID and that's represented in the first 24 bits. The second 24 bits are assigned by the manufacturer to the device. So all the LAN cards or what we sometimes call network interface cards manufactured by one company in one process would be assigned different, uh, would have the same first 24 bits but the next, tw the last 24 bits would be different different amongst all devices. For humans, writing down and remembering 48 bits is not easy. It's easy to make a mistake when you write 48 zeros and ones. So the 48-bit addresses are converted into a, a slightly easier format to read and write. And it's this hexadecimal format. There are six two-digit hexadecimal numbers. So here's an example of a 48-bit address, but written in hexadecimal. Remember hexadecimal goes from 0 to 15. One hex digit is 4 bits. So here you see there are 12 hexadecimal digits, or 48 bits. And the pairs of hexadecimal digits are separated by a colon or sometimes a dash, the different format. Let's have a look at some example addresses and talk about the split between the, the first 24 and the last 24. So on my computer, how many network interface cards do my, does my laptop have? Not one. Two. Good. Uh, I have Wi-Fi and I have wireless LAN or Wi-Fi or IEEE 802.11 and I have wired LAN or Ethernet 802.3 is the standard. So I have two interfaces. In fact, Wi-Fi and Ethernet use the same format of addresses. They, they have many similarities. On my computer I can see some details about those interfaces. My interface configuration of my Ethernet, ETH0, and it shows me some information and this is the thing of interest, the hardware address. So that's the address that's assigned by the manufacturer of my, my LAN card. It's actually a, a chip on board the motherboard. F0 through to B7. 48 bits but expressed in hexadecimal. My 
wireless LAN card also has a hardware or IEEE 48-bit address, different value. The concept is that all devices in the world will have unique 48-bit addresses, globally unique addresses. There are some exceptions though. The first six digits identify the manufacturer of that device, or at least some company associated with a manufacturer, the designer maybe. And the last six digits in the hexadecimal version identify uh, within that manufacturer that the particular device. Who manufactured my devices? Anyone know? Who manufactured my LAN card and wireless LAN card? Anyone want to guess? Who manufactures wireless LAN chips or hardware for LAN cards? Have a check on your own computer. See if you can find your hardware address. We'll have a look in a moment. My Ethernet card is a Realtek, um, uses Realtek hardware and some model RTL811 or, or similar. So this is the, the brand name or, or the, the manufacturer for the LAN card and for the wireless LAN it's just listed as a network controller. It's an Intel wireless chip. Okay. Now. The MAC addresses themselves identify the manufacturers. Let's look at the wireless LAN chip first. Note the first six digits, 8CA982. So that identifies a manufacturer. And IEEE have a website. They register those first six digits to particular companies. So they have a website where you can look up the manufacturer that I have, 8CA982. And you do a search, if my internet works, and it tells me that the manufacturer for all LAN cards which start with those six hex digits is Intel. Okay, so that identifies the manufacturer of that card. If we do it for my Ethernet card, it was Realtek. What do we have? F0DEF1. We look it up and we get some com company withdrawn Infocom. Okay, so it doesn't identify real tech, so it doesn't necessarily identify the, the brand name of the device, but usually the, the, the company that designed it. In many cases, someone designs it for some other company. So this is the, really the manufacturer of the device in that case, my LAN card. Your next quiz will involve you trying to look up, and, and, and I suggest you have a look at your laptop, your mobile phone, or any device with a LAN or Wi-Fi card, and you can look up the, the actual manufacturer of that, or who's assigned as the manufacturer. So what happens? The manufacturer has this first six digits, and when they manufacture the cards, they assign a unique last six hexadecimal digits. Uh, are MAC addresses unique in the world? Can two people have the same MAC address? Check. See if you can find the MAC address on your phone. It's there. Your phone has a MAC address. You have Wi-Fi on your phone. If you look in the, the status, uh, in the advanced settings somewhere, you find the, the MAC address on your phone. 
In theory, devices shouldn't have the same MAC address. They should be globally unique. But in practice nowadays that they can. Either the manufacturer makes a mistake and assigns two devices the same address. But nowadays you can set the address in software. So in fact on my laptop I can change the address which gives the possibility that two or more devices can have the same address. But in practice usually they don't. So, all of our stations have a MAC address and when we want to send frames from one station to another, we'll see the format of the frame includes the source and destination MAC address. These 48-bit MAC addresses are used not just in uh, Ethernet, but also in other technologies use them. There's a new, newer version which is not so common, which is, uses 64 bits, but it's, only, it's been used in some technologies like Firewire. We'll talk about the special case in a moment. Everyone found their MAC address on their phone? You don't have a phone? <laughs> See if you can find your MAC address. Find it? Right, you may see a MAC address and a Bluetooth address, same format. So Bluetooth uses the same 48-bit or 12 hexadecimal digit address. Bluetooth is a different technology. Right? You should, you may see two MAC addresses, one for Wi-Fi. One for Bluetooth. You won't have an Ethernet address because you don't have wired LAN on your phone. But on a PC, on a laptop, you'll also have your Ethernet address. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi. But Wi-Fi uses the same format of addresses. There are many similarities between Wi-Fi and Ethernet. One's 802.3, the other's 802.11. And Bluetooth has similarities as well. So. When one station wants to send to another, they send 802.3 frames. And this is the structure of the frames. There's data. Okay, our frame contains data, minimum of 46 bytes, normally up to 1,500 bytes. There's an extension that allows jumbo frames, much larger, but not so common. So the data up to 1,500 bytes. Then we have a header at the front and a trailer at the end. Quite simple, the header contains the destination address, the 48-bit address or 6-byte address that we're sending to, and the source address, who sent it. It contains a 2-byte field called the ether type, and this really identifies what type of data is inside this. So our Ethernet frame contains data from other protocols. What is the other protocol? It's usually specified by the ether type. In practice, you'll mainly see the ether type is the value 8, meaning the, other, the type of data is the internet protocol data. It's from the internet. We'll see that later. At the end, we attach a checksum. This is error detection. So that when the receiver receives this, it uses the checksum to make sure the data has no errors. If there are errors, then we need to fix it somehow. Uh, there are possible jumbo frames, not very common. This is really at the, the data link layer or the MAC layer. In addition, there's one byte of extra information added at the start by the physical layer. So before we transmit this, we need to transmit an additional one byte at the start. So how does it work in frame delivery? Here's an, our, our example of six, six stations, and I've given them some fake MAC addresses. Okay, I just uh, chose some MAC addresses for our six stations. The switch doesn't necessarily need a MAC address. The switch is there just for sending frames onto others.
the, the MAC or hardware address is assigned by the manufacturer. So here we have our six stations. Let's say A wants to send to D. So A would create the frame. Source address, sorry, the first field is the destination address, 20 CF through to 67. So the destination address would be that of D. Source address is that of A. Ether type identifies the type of data we have, which is usually the internet protocol. We include the data and then attach a checksum, which is some information that allows the receiver to check that there are no errors inside the data. In before the midterm, I think we talked about a parity check. It's a very simple checksum, but there are others, more complex checksums that allow for error detection. A wants to transmit the frame to D. Where does A send the frame? Where does A send the frame? Where is A in our picture going to send the frame? There's one option. A has a cable to the switch, so it transmits to the switch. Okay? There's no other option. In, in a star topology or in the switched ethernet, you just transmit across the cable that's plugged into your computer which is, goes to the switch. So we transmit a frame to the switch and then the switch has the job to realize destination is this 20 da, 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 6, 7 address, send it on to D. And the way that the switch does that is the switch has some table. It's a bit small on this. I should have made it bigger. But the switch has a set of ports which the computers are plugged into. This one has eight ports. On the example, I have just six ports or six computers plugged into this. So we can think port one through to six are being used in this example. And the switch maintains some table that maps the ports to the MAC addresses. So it learns when the, really when the cables are first plugged in, this switch learns that on port 1, at the other end point, is F045. So it maintains a table saying on port 1 you can reach this MAC address which identifies computer A. And on port 4 is 20 to, through to 67. So this table is maintained inside the switch. It's created when the, really when the cables are plugged in by one of the, the, the protocols in operation stores them in memory and therefore it's quite simple because when A creates a frame it transmits to the switch the destination address of that frame is used to determine for the switch destination address is 20 through to 67 switch looks in the table realizes it needs to go on port 4 transmits on port 4 and it's received by computer D so it just transmits to the switch which forwards it onto the destination That's almost it by Ethernet. Any questions? You use it every day, whether it's at home or in the labs or in an office. Uh, so wired LANs, most, most wired LANs in use today use this technology. How fast can we send from A to D? Again, it depends upon the data rate supported by the LAN cards inside A and D and the data rate supported by the switch. It will use the, the highest data rate that they all support. Typically 100 megabits per second or 1 gigabit per second in most technologies. Yeah. Yes, in this case just if, if B wants to send to E, it creates a frame. So if B wants to send to E, it creates a frame. Destination address is the MAC address of E. Source address is the MAC address of B. Puts the data inside, transmits this frame 
to the switch. The switch recognizes that that destination address needs to go on port 5 and transmits it across this link. So allows any pair of, com of stations to communicate with each other. Note that Ethernet is only for internal LAN communications. If there's some web server that we want to connect to in the US, and here's our LAN inside our office here, or in our classroom, for example, then this Ethernet doesn't support communications to those outside the LAN. What we would need, and our next topic covers it, is that one of these devices, let's say C, has another link to it that goes to another network via a LAN or a wide area network. And then C would send on to that next network and then go for on and on until it reaches the destination. So that's not what LAN's about. LAN's is just internal to the local area. Any questions on Ethernet? Quick topic. Uh, so be aware of the, the address formats. Okay, you'll see them. Um, I'll see one more example in a moment, but you'll see them uh, a lot in, in practice, the 48-bit addresses, the frame format, and the, be aware of the technologies that is, it uses twisted pair, full duplex communications in a star topology. Data rates of 100 megabits per second or 1,000 megabits per second. When you go home tonight, I suggest uh, if you do a search for, no, you'll be working on your assignment, but while you have a break, you'll do a search. You found your MAC address on your phone. Just search on, on a website, search on the internet for IEEE registration or IEEE addresses, and you'll come across this website, which allows you to look up, given the first six digits of the MAC address, find the manufacturer. Note that it expects it in the dashed format here. One last example on Ethernet. I think we may have seen something like this or similar at the start of the course. This is a, a capture of some packets sent in a network. Seven different packets. What was happening in this packet capture? Have a look at mainly the info there. What do you think was happening? What did the user do? Uh, when I recorded the packets being sent across a network in this case. So this is a, this software shows a record of packets sent and or received from a computer. And I did this while I was running an application on my computer. And in this case it recorded or I've filtered out and shown just seven packets across what about uh, 45 milliseconds, the, this exchange took place, place. Source and destination address, not MAC addresses, IP addresses. That's our next topic. What happened in this exchange? What did I do on my computer? Look at the info in those seven packets, something you may recognize. What did I do? The things you don't recognize, skip over, but there's some words there you at least recognize. What did I do in this case? What's here? Yeah. 
act, yeah, there's some acts there. Even simpler, what did I want to get? IT.html. Get is part of web browsing. When we use our web browser to visit web pages, we use a protocol called HTTP and we send a request message from our browser to the server saying I want to get some web page and the server sends back that web page. This fourth message was my computer sending a message to a web server saying I want to get the, the file in the, the root directory in slash directory called it.html and where's the response back? Where's the web page? Seven packets, which one do you think contains the web page? Not five. The web page. This is the request for the web page. Here's the response. Let's zoom in. Some of the other details we, we will not try to explain yet. The request, if I double click I can zoom in on that particular packet. This was the request. We used HTTP. The request, I did this one actually two years ago. No, I didn't do it at the start of this course. The request at that time was to it.sittuac.th slash it.html. So this was my browser sending a request. What browser? My Firefox browser sending a request to a web server. The protocols used, HTTP, we haven't covered it yet, but TCP and IP and Ethernet. Here it's listed as Ethernet 2, but generally Ethernet. The Ethernet frame destination address, which station my computer was sending it to, so 0, 0, 5, 0 and so on. Source address, that was the address of my computer at that stage, so my computer sent it. And the type is that ether type field which just identifies what's inside this ethernet frame is an IP packet. So it says, what is the data? This software doesn't show the trailer. It doesn't show the checksum. That's hidden from this software. It's usually done in hardware. The frame was 367 bytes. So a 6-byte destination, a 6-byte source, 2-byte type, and the rest was really data with respect to that frame. And the response that came from a web server came most likely, I can't remember whether I was using LAN or Wi-Fi, but maybe came from a wireless access point to my laptop at the time. Was 569 bytes. It was an Ethernet frame. Destination, source, type. It contained an IP packet. And our next topic talks about IP, the Internet Protocol, and TCP. And inside was our web page, or the response. The response contained some OK message. The request was OK. Here's the response. Some other information about the server, the date of the response, and so on. And most importantly, if we scroll down, it contains line-based text data, which is that was the web page that the server sent back to my laptop. So when my laptop received that, that response, it displayed the HTML on the screen. So that's just a simple example showing the Ethernet frames in the context of a, a web page request and response. Questions on Ethernet? Look at your phones again, okay, stop playing your games, look out your phone and find another address on your phone. 
try and find another address. Go to, back to where you found your MAC address and see if there are any other types of addresses in your phone. IMEI, the IM, IMEI is some identifier for the, for the mobile phone or the SIM card. Signal strength is not an address, it's how strong the signal is that you're receiving. Maybe you'll see another address. Or it may be in a different screen when you access uh, a particular network connection like Wi-Fi. But I think you've seen them before and, and in the last 10 minutes we'll talk about another type of address. And we'll when you connect to Wi-Fi, when you connect to a, a wireless access point, it sometimes takes a few seconds to connect. And sometimes you see uh, uh, looking for IP address or something about an IP address. That's another type of address which we'll introduce now and then tomorrow we'll talk about the internet and, and the role of IP addresses. But because I think most of you have seen IP addresses, let's just introduce them in the last 10 minutes. And we see some other examples up here. MAC addresses identify computers inside a LAN. What we'll see the internet is made up of is many LANs and wide area networks, separate ones, connected together to create one large network, the internet. And in the case of communicating between computers in the internet, we have a second type of address called an IP address. And the examples from my packet capture are these two columns of source and destination. This one, source address is 203.131.209.72 and the destination 10.10.99.251. They are a different type of address called an IP address. So this is not specific to Ethernet anymore, but moving on to the internet. How long is a MAC address or an Ethernet address? The topic we just covered, how long is the address? How many bits? Look at your slides with the MAC address, how many bits? When we talk about addresses, they're usually represented in binary. Even though we write them in hexadecimal or some other format, the, the raw format is binary. It's not 64, it's 48 bits. Okay, well done. IEEE 802 dot addresses are 48 bits. There's a variation which are 64 bits, but we're not touching them. 48 bits, convert 9, hexadecimal 9 into a 4-bit yeah, number, and do that for every other hex digit, and we get 48 bits. So when your computer creates a frame and transmits that frame, the address contained inside is a 48-bit number. But just to make it easier for humans to look at, computers often convert them when they display those addresses into hexadecimal. It's the same with IP addresses. How long are IP addresses? Anyone know or want to take a guess? They're not 48 bits, IP addresses. Different type of address, but you may have seen or, or heard of the length. Anyone know the length of an IP address in bits? Let's write some down. Or maybe look at an example on my computer first. My wireless LAN interface had a hardware address or MAC address. This is a 48-bit Ethernet address. But it also has an internet address, INET, and my IP address is 32 bits in length. 10.10.107.238. This is the human friendly form, but the computer stores it as actually a 32 bit number. So this is an IP address, or more precisely an IP version 4 address. Let's just do an example and, and talk about the conversion between 
the human friendly form and the 32 bit computer friendly form. So, where do we get 32 bits from that one? 10.10.107.238. So an example IP address. What was it? 10.10.107.238. This is the human friendly form for IP version 4 addresses. And it represents 32 bits. The scheme is there are four, four decimal numbers, not hexadecimal. Now we use decimal numbers. And each decimal number is separated by a dot. This is not a decimal point, it's just a dot. And we represent each decimal number as an 8-bit binary value. So convert 10, decimal 10, to, to binary as an 8-bit number. What do we get? Eight bits. Okay, so our 8-bit number for decimal 10 and 10 decimal, well, luckily that'll be the same. One oh seven. Is that right? One oh seven. You will check with your calculator and two hundred and thirty eight. I'm going to run out of space. Can you tell me? One, 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 zero. Almost fit it in. Quite simply, just convert those four decimal numbers into 8-bit binary values. That's a real IP address, the 32-bit value that your computer stores in memory and sends when it sends an IP packet. But when your computer displays it to us, it shows in a, the human-friendly form of what's called the dotted decimal notation. Take each 8-bit value, convert it to decimal, separate those four decimal numbers by dots. Every IP address that we will deal with in this course, in the remainder of the course, is in this format. It's either 32-bit value or the dotted decimal format. Any questions on this conversion? Let's, we've got some slides on it that we'll see in the next topic, but I think that's quite easy to capture that if you've got an IP address, the dot or decimal notation, you should be able to convert to binary. Or if you've got a binary address, you should be able to convert to dot or decimal. Okay? We're moving beyond Ethernet now, but to the Internet. How many possible addresses? IP addresses. About how many? 32 bits. Well, there are 2 to the power of 32 possible values, which is about 4 billion. So there are about 4 billion possible IP addresses. Now, there are some exceptions. Some, some are not allowed to be used. Some are reserved for special purposes. But with a 32-bit address, there are about 4 billion possible values, meaning in the world, if we use this IP address, we can give addresses to about 4 billion different devices. How many devices in the world that want IP addresses? How many mobile phones in the world? Many. 
add up the mobile phones, PCs, laptops, all the servers, all the access points, all the different devices, uh, nowadays cars, washing machines, and into the future, and it's much more than four billion. So if we want to give a unique address to every device in the world, assigning them a 32-bit value is not enough. Now there are some schemes to, tr to try and work around that. The fact that there's not enough, there's some way, special ways to make sure that we do have enough. But what people have done over the last 10 or 20 years is developed a new version, IP version 6, which uses 128 bits. 128 bits is something like billions and billions and billions for each person in the world. Okay, so 128 bits is not a problem. On my computer, that's called an IPv6 address, and it's using a different format. It's shown here, this strange set of hexadecimal digits. That's all we're going to say about IPv6. In this course, we'll focus on the more, more widely used, the older version, IP version 4. So what we'll do tomorrow is we'll talk about what is the internet, and then we'll look at how do computers get IP addresses and how they use them. But I'll assume from now on, if I present an IP address in dotted decimal notation, you can convert that to binary and vice versa. Let's stop there and tomorrow we'll move on to the internet slides and that's our last topic we'll cover tomorrow and next week.